the mark of the beast a deceptive symbol of convenience and efficiency. The concept of the mark of the beast often evokes fear and dread among those familiar with biblical prophecy. Many believe it to be a terrifying symbol of ultimate evil, coercively imposed upon humanity. However, a closer examination of biblical texts reveals that the mark of the beast is intertwined with both fear and convenience. Contrary to popular belief, the mark will likely be presented in a way that capitalizes on humanity's inherent love for convenience and efficiency. I personally believe that people will line up eagerly to take it, drawn by the promise of streamlined living and improved daily functions. From the dawn of civilization, humans have continually sought ways to make life easier and more efficient. The invention of the wheel revolutionized transport, making it possible to move goods and people with less effort. The development of the internet transformed how we communicate, access information, and conduct business, drastically reducing the time and effort required for these activities. The most recent technological advancements, such as artificial intelligence and automation, further illustrate our relentless pursuit of convenience and efficiency. These innovations promise to take over mundane tasks, allowing us to focus on more meaningful activities. Large corporations thrive by tapping into this human desire for convenience and efficiency. Large corporations have made literal billions of dollars because of these two words, convenience and efficiency. Uber, for instance, revolutionized the transportation industry by offering a service where users can book a ride to their exact location within minutes, all with just a few taps on their smartphones. This level of convenience and efficiency has made Uber a global phenomenon. Similarly, companies like DoorDash, Uber Eats, and Just Eat have transformed food delivery. No longer do people need to call restaurants directly or wait for long periods. With these services, food arrives at one's doorstep with minimal effort. The convenience and efficiency provided by these companies have made them immensely popular. The financial industry has also evolved to meet the demand for convenience. The transition from cash to digital payments began with ATMs and credit debit cards and has now advanced to mobile payment systems like Apple Pay. In some countries, people even use microchip implants to make payments, exemplifying the extreme lengths to which humans will go for the sake of convenience. Sweden, for instance, has been at the forefront of this trend, with many citizens opting for microchip implants to make transactions smoother and faster. Biometric authentication on mobile devices is another example. The ability to unlock a phone or authorize a payment with a fingerprint or facial recognition saves time and enhances security, making daily life more efficient. Given humanity's proclivity for convenience, it is not far-fetched to envision the mark of the beast being introduced as a cutting-edge solution for modern living. Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 to 17 describes the mark as something that will be required for buying and selling. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This passage suggests that the mark will be integral to economic activity, making it highly desirable in a world that increasingly values efficiency and convenience. The mark will likely be presented as a means to simplify transactions reduce fraud, and enhance security. People, eager for such benefits, will queue up to receive it. However, the biblical narrative warns that the mark is not just a tool for economic convenience, but a symbol of allegiance to the beast. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 to 11 issues a stern warning about the spiritual consequences of taking the mark. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Despite this severe warning, the allure of convenience and efficiency will be powerful. 
The mark of the beast will likely be marketed as a revolutionary technology that eliminates the need for cash, cards, or even mobile phones. It could integrate all personal, financial, and medical information into a single, easily accessible form. The benefits will seem too good to pass up, leading people to willingly embrace the mark. The real danger of the mark of the beast lies not in the act of buying or selling, but in what it signifies. Worship and allegiance. Satan, described in the Bible as a deceiver, understands human nature well. He knows that people are more likely to accept something that appears beneficial and convenient. By presenting the mark as a means of enhancing daily life, he can subtly shift people's allegiance away from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 reminds us that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. This deception will be at the heart of the mark of the beast. It will be packaged as a positive forward-thinking innovation, much like the technological advancements we celebrate today. The convenience it offers will mask the spiritual compromise it demands. The age of deception mentioned in the Bible will be unlike anything the world has seen. Revelation chapter 13 verses 14 to 15 speaks of great signs and wonders performed by the beast, deceiving those who dwell on the earth. In such an era, the mark of the beast will be just one aspect of a larger strategy to lead people away from God. Believers must understand that the mark of the beast will not be an obvious or fearsome symbol. It will be subtly integrated into society, promoted as a solution to everyday problems. Revelation 14, 6, 7 depicts three angels flying in the sky, proclaiming the eternal gospel and warning people not to take the mark. This divine intervention underscores the gravity of the situation and the deceptive nature of the mark. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The fact that God sends angels to warn humanity indicates that the mark will not be easily recognizable as something evil. It will blend seamlessly into the fabric of society, appealing to our desire for ease and efficiency. Therefore, it is crucial for believers to remain vigilant and discerning. This extraordinary divine intervention signifies just how unprecedented and perilous these times will be. Throughout the Bible, God has communicated through prophets, visions, and his written word, but the direct appearance of angels to warn humanity is exceedingly rare. The deployment of angels to proclaim the eternal gospel and issue a dire warning is a testament to the extreme deception that will characterize the end times. It reveals that the level of deceit will be so profound that without such supernatural intervention, even the faithful could be led astray. Consider the magnitude of this action. God, who has always worked through human agents in his spirit, chooses to send his angels visibly into the world. These celestial beings, who typically remain unseen, are now tasked with a mission so critical that their presence is necessary to cut through the pervasive lies and illusions. This is an unprecedented move in biblical history underscoring the critical nature of the warning against the mark of the beast. Imagine living in a world where technological advancements and societal norms continuously push the boundaries of convenience and efficiency. In such a setting, the mark of the beast will be introduced as the ultimate convenience, a solution to all economic and security issues. It will be marketed as an essential tool for living in a modern, interconnected world making it appear indispensable. The pressure to conform will be immense with the mark integrated into every facet of life. This is why God's intervention is so significant. The deceptive nature of the mark will be so overwhelming that it necessitates an extraordinary divine response. The angel's proclamation serves as a beacon of truth amid the darkness of deception. Their message is a clear, loud call to worship God and reject the mark highlighting the spiritual battle that underlies this seemingly mundane choice. The fact that God goes to these lengths, sending his angels to preach and warn, demonstrates the severity of the situation. It highlights the critical importance of the decision facing humanity. This divine act is a clarion call to awaken from spiritual complacency 
and recognize the true nature of the mark of the beast. It is a call to fear God, give Him glory, and worship Him alone. In this context, believers must cultivate a deep awareness and understanding of these prophetic warnings. The times will be perilous, marked by deception so profound that without vigilance and discernment, many could be led astray. The extraordinary measure of angelic intervention is a testament to the seriousness of the times, a divine effort to ensure that the truth is heard and heeded. God's unprecedented action in sending angels to preach the gospel and warn against the mark of the beast is a clear indicator of the extreme and deceptive nature of the end times. It is a stark reminder that in the face of overwhelming societal pressure and technological allure, Believers must remain steadfast and vigilant, always seeking to discern the truth and maintain their allegiance to God. While the mark of the beast will initially be promoted as a convenient and efficient solution to many of life's problems, it is also a symbol of fear and coercion. The Bible makes it clear that accepting the mark is not just a matter of personal convenience, but a decision with severe spiritual and eternal consequences. This dual nature of the mark, combining the allure of convenience with the threat of dire repercussions, creates a situation ripe for fear and coercion, especially for those who refuse to comply. Biblical Context of Fear and Persecution The Book of Revelation paints a vivid picture of the fear and coercion associated with the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 to 17 states, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. The phrase, forced all people, implies a level of compulsion that goes beyond mere suggestion or voluntary acceptance. It indicates a situation where individuals are coerced into receiving the mark with significant consequences for those who resist. The inability to buy or sell without the mark represents a form of economic persecution, a powerful tool to ensure compliance through fear of deprivation and hardship. In the modern era, technology has provided new means of surveillance and control that could be employed to enforce compliance with the mark of the beast. Governments and corporations increasingly use digital tools to monitor behavior, track movements, and manage economic transactions. These technologies, while often introduced under the guise of convenience and security, can also be weaponized to exert control over individuals. For example, the use of digital IDs, facial recognition, and cashless payment systems can be leveraged to create a comprehensive surveillance state. In such a system, refusing to accept the mark of the beast could result in being cut off from essential services, barred from employment and excluded from society, this would create a climate of fear where the threat of losing one's livelihood and basic necessities forces compliance. China's social credit system provides a contemporary illustration of how technology can be used to control and coerce populations. In this system, citizens are scored based on their behavior, with low scores resulting in restricted access to services, travel bans, and social stigmatization. A similar system could be employed to enforce the mark of the beast using digital tools to reward compliance and punish dissent. The Role of Fear in Religious Persecution Fear has always been a powerful tool in religious persecution. The Bible warns that in the end times, believers will face intense persecution for their faith. Revelation chapter 13 verse 7 states, it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, and it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. This passage indicates that the beast will have global authority and will actively persecute those who refuse to worship it. The mark of the beast will be a key instrument in this persecution, serving as both a symbol of allegiance to the beast and a tool for identifying and targeting dissenters. The fear of persecution will be a significant factor in compelling people to accept the mark. Believers who refuse the mark will face social ostracism, economic deprivation, and potentially even death. 
This environment of fear will make it incredibly challenging to stand firm in one's faith and resist the coercive pressures to conform. The psychological impact of fear and coercion cannot be understated. Fear is a powerful motivator that can lead individuals to act against their principles and values. The fear of losing one's job, being unable to provide for one's family or facing imprisonment and torture can drive people to make decisions they would otherwise reject. In the context of the mark of the beast, this fear will be amplified by the pervasive control and surveillance capabilities of the beast's regime. The knowledge that one's every action is being monitored and judged will create a pervasive sense of anxiety and helplessness. This psychological pressure will be used to break down resistance and enforce compliance. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 to 11 describes the fate of those who receive the mark. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. I sometimes think of the end of days and how the events described in the book of Revelation will unfold. While God has revealed the outline of these events, there are aspects of Revelation that remain uncertain, leaving us to wait and see how they will come to pass. One such aspect is the introduction of a one-world religion. I wonder, how could this even be possible? How will the Antichrist unite the entire world under one religion? The Bible makes it clear that in the last days there will be a one-world religion, but the mechanism of how this will happen is perplexing. To illustrate my point, consider politics in our nation today. The political landscape in our nation currently is incredibly divisive, nearly pushing us to the brink of civil war. The mere mention of Democrats or Republicans stirs strong emotions in people. Figures like Donald Trump and Joe Biden can evoke a wide range of reactions, sometimes even anger, just by appearing on screen. I know multiple families that have stopped speaking to each other because of differing political views. Politics is extraordinarily divisive, but I would argue that religion is just as, if not more, divisive. History attests to this. Wars have been fought over religion, and nations have risen and fallen because of it. Religion, much like politics, can deeply divide people, making the idea of a unified world religion even more astounding. Look into the history of wars, the First, Second, Third and Fourth Crusades. The Crusades, 1096 to 1291, were a series of military campaigns initiated by the Latin Church to reclaim Jerusalem and the Holy Land from Muslim rule, involving several major expeditions like the First and Third Crusades. The Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648 in Central Europe, began as a conflict between Catholic and Protestant states within the Holy Roman Empire, but eventually drew in most of Europe, combining both religious and political motivations. The French Wars of Religion, 1562 to 1598, saw Catholics and Huguenots, French Calvinists, clashing in a series of conflicts marked by events like the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, ultimately leading to the Edict of Nantes, which granted religious tolerance to Huguenots. This is why I wonder how the Antichrist will achieve it, how he will unite the world under one religion. Uniting the world under a single religion is no small feat and has never been done before. For people to abandon the religions they hold near and dear to follow a new global religion is an immense challenge. However, one important aspect to remember about the last days, as described in the book of Revelation, is that it will be a time of great deception unlike anything the world has ever seen. This theme of deception is a constant in eschatological writings, from Jesus speaking about the last days in Matthew 24 to the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. These passages inform us of the scale and power of the deception in the last days. 
It is this unparalleled deception that will likely play a crucial role in ushering in the new world religion. The Antichrist will use this deception to convince people to abandon their deeply held beliefs and unite under a single religious system. Understanding the magnitude of this deception helps us grasp how such a monumental shift could occur in the end times. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 to 6 And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. The concept of a one world religion, as described in Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 to 18, is referred to as the great harlot and is integral to the end time scenario. As Christians, it is crucial to understand and recognize the dangers associated with this prophesied global religious system. In the Old Testament, the term harlot is frequently employed as a metaphor for those who pursue false religions. The actual identity and structure of this one world religion have been subjects of debate among Bible commentators and theologians for centuries, leading to a variety of interpretations and theories. These interpretations propose the possibility of the one world religion being Catholicism, Islam, the New Age movement, or even a religion that has yet to be conceived. An internet search will yield numerous other theories and possibilities. Since his papacy began in 2013, Pope Francis has undertaken significant efforts to foster relationships between different religious communities, with a notable focus on Muslims. His primary aim has been to promote peace, mutual understanding, and cooperation among diverse faith groups. A landmark event in this endeavor was the signing of the Document on Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together in 2019, which he co-authored with Sheikh Ahmed El Tayeb, the Grand Imam of al Azhar, during a visit to Abu Dhabi. This document emphasized the importance of interfaith dialogue and collaboration for global peace. One significant manifestation of these efforts is the Abrahamic Family House in Abu Dhabi. This initiative embodies the principles outlined in the Document on Human Fraternity, serving as a physical and symbolic representation of the commitment to fostering understanding and coexistence among the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. The Abrahamic Family House includes a church, a mosque, and a synagogue within one complex, each retaining its unique identity while promoting mutual respect and dialogue. This project exemplifies the strides being made towards greater religious unity and understanding, which is a step towards the formation of a one-world religion. Pope Francis has consistently advocated for interfaith dialogue and understanding. He has made numerous statements highlighting the commonalities between Christianity and Islam, particularly their shared belief in one God. These efforts are seen by some as indicative of a movement towards a more unified global religious framework, potentially aligning with the prophesied one world religion. As Christians, we must be vigilant and discerning in these times. The notion of a one world religion under the false prophet is a recurring theme in eschatological interpretations of Revelation. Potentially, this false religion will encompass a variety of existing religions, sects, and ideologies, or possibly form a new, singular entity. 
This religion is expected to be supported by miraculous signs and wonders, lending it an aura of legitimacy and divine approval. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 to 18 provides several characteristics of this one world religion. It will dominate all peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, suggesting that it will possess universal authority granted by the political and religious powers of the time. This universal authority will enable the one world religion to exert significant influence over global affairs, aligning various religious traditions under a singular unifying banner. The imagery of the great harlot seated on a scarlet beast adorned with blasphemous names further underscores the deceptive and idolatrous nature of this false religion. The harlot's opulence, described in terms of purple and scarlet clothing, gold, precious stones and pearls, symbolizes the seductive allure of this global religious system, drawing people away from true worship. Throughout history, various religious movements and leaders have been scrutinized in light of this prophecy, with some suggesting that contemporary efforts towards interfaith unity could be precursors to the prophesied One World Religion. The actions and statements of religious leaders, particularly those of global influence like Pope Francis, are often examined for signs of alignment with this eschatological narrative. Could it be that the world is being ushered into a one-world religion and the world has not even noticed it? The establishment of the Abrahamic family house and the signing of the document on human fraternity are significant milestones in the ongoing efforts to foster global religious harmony. These initiatives, while aimed at promoting peace and understanding, are also steps towards the eventual realization of the one world religion described in Revelation. In addition to these efforts, the rise of secularism and the blending of religious and spiritual beliefs in the modern world contribute to the evolving landscape of global faith. The increasing acceptance of a pluralistic approach to spirituality, where individuals draw from multiple religious traditions, aligns with the idea of a unified global religion. This syncretism, while promoting tolerance and inclusivity, also paves the way for the potential emergence of a one-world religious system. It will be a time of great deception. We will get to a point where we can't even trust churches or ministers or even YouTube channels. There will be preachers who encourage their churches to take the mark of the beast. This might sound implausible to some, but history and current trends indicate otherwise. In times of great upheaval, people often look to their leaders for guidance, and religious leaders are no exception. However, not all leaders are trustworthy, and in the chaos and confusion of the end times, even pastors and preachers may be deceived or complicit in leading their flocks astray. Consider the influence that religious leaders have over their congregations. Many people place immense trust in their pastors, believing that they are guided by God and that their teachings are aligned with God's will. This trust can be exploited, especially in a time of global crisis where fear and uncertainty dominate. The mark of the beast, as described in Revelation, will be presented as a solution to some of the most pressing issues facing humanity. It might be framed as a necessary step for survival, security, or even unity. In such a scenario, preachers who are either deceived themselves or who have ulterior motives might encourage their congregations to take this mark, believing it to be in their best interest. The idea of preachers advocating for something as dire as the mark of the beast is not far-fetched when we examine the history of religious compromise and the susceptibility of humans to deception. Throughout history, there have been instances where religious leaders have led their followers into error. The various cults throughout history are examples of how religious authority can be misused. In the modern era, we see televangelists and prosperity gospel preachers who exploit their congregations for financial gain, often living lavish lifestyles while their followers struggle. These examples illustrate how religious leaders can be swayed by power, money and influence, leading them to make decisions that are contrary to true biblical teaching. I recently watched a documentary about a pastor who encouraged his congregants to take out business loans 
of $5,000, $20,000, and more to give to the church. If a pastor can convince people to go into significant debt for the church, do you think they wouldn't also advise their congregation to take the mark of the beast? Furthermore, the rise of false prophets and teachers is a sign of the end times that Jesus warned about in Matthew 24. He said that many false prophets will arise and deceive many. These false prophets will come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They will perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. This warning indicates that the deception will be so great that even those who are knowledgeable and faithful could be led astray. In such an environment, it is not hard to imagine that some preachers will advocate for the mark of the beast, believing they are doing what is right. The last days are approaching, and while we do not fully know yet what this one religion will be, we are seeing signs of the formation of a one-world religion. We do not know exactly how the religion of the Antichrist will take shape in the last days, whether it will be a new religion entirely or a meshing together of existing religions. However, we do know it will be a time of great deception. We are increasingly living in a time where it is getting more difficult to tell the truth from a lie. The capabilities of artificial intelligence, AI, are advancing rapidly and we are nearing a point where it will be challenging to believe what we see with our own eyes. AI technology can create hyper-realistic images, videos, and even voice recordings that can be indistinguishable from reality. Deepfake technology, for example, can produce videos of people saying and doing things they never actually said or did. This technology has the potential to be used for great deception, creating false narratives and misleading people on a massive scale. In such a world, the truth becomes a rare commodity and deception becomes the norm. We will get to a point where we can't even trust churches or ministers or even YouTube channels. You will be able to trust only your Bible. This is why it is so important to know your Bible for yourself. The Bible is the Word of God and it is the ultimate truth. In a world full of deception, the Bible remains a constant, unchanging source of truth and guidance. Knowing the scriptures and having a personal relationship with God will be crucial in navigating the deceptive landscape of the last days.